Welcome back to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and we are back to regular programming now. The last 16 episodes of the podcast have been a literature series. And because the summer is over, we're going to finish that now as well and get back to core issues around Korea and North Korea. And there's no better way to do that than with today's guest and today's topic. This is Sean King. Sean is a senior vice president at Park Industries, an affiliated scholar at the University of Notre Dame, and a former senior advisor for Asia in the U.S. Foreign Commercial Service within the American Department of Commerce. And Sean is also a returning guest on the podcast. We did a podcast a little over a year ago now when we spoke about the summit diplomacy and the summit season that was happening with Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump meeting in Vietnam and Singapore. And we spoke about a lot of the underlying issues about that and a lot of things that were being missed inside the media and by people who were not taking a close enough look at just what really mattered behind the scenes and on the ground. And some of that will bleed into this podcast in some ways, so I'm going to link that below. But this is also a completely different topic and one that Sean has a personal history with. This is going to be a look at German reunification and the lessons that can be applied to the South Korean and North Korean contexts. And this, of course, is pertinent today because this is the 30th anniversary of German reunification. And as I mentioned before, Sean was on the ground in some of those early days. As a student, he visited East Germany on a number of occasions. And as he will say, and as he will show, very few people there at the time could see what was about to happen. It seems obvious in hindsight that German reunification was about to happen, about to force itself back together with this divided nation. But it just wasn't obvious at the time. And as a nation divided in this way, Korea have had a fascination with the German experience for a number of years. Of course, South Koreans and North Koreans spent an awful lot of time thinking and worrying and posturing towards reunification. And of course, Germany fits the bill well here. It seems to be the perfect analogy, the perfect example. And all the policy implications and challenges and lessons seem like they should apply across to the Korean context. The trouble is, many of them just don't. And here with Sean, we're going to drag a lot of these out in all their detail. We're going to look at the origins of the divisions of both countries, the Cold War context they found themselves in, the ideologies and the internationalism or lack thereof that really separate the two contexts, the differences between East Germany and North Korea, and the differences between West Germany and South Korea, and important questions of how much information and international contact was happening within East Germany prior to reunification, and the contrast of that with the lack of openness that we currently see in regards to North Korea. There are a lot of questions here. Thoughts about the Soviet Union and China, economic challenges, government policies, international connections, and deep fundamental issues like human rights. But as you'll see throughout this podcast, the most important thing from it the most important thing that people can learn is just how challenging this is going to be for the Korean context and how different it is going to be from the German. But from here on out, I'm going to let Sean explain that for you. And for listeners that are interested below the podcast, I'm not just going to link our previous discussion with Sean, but I'm also going to link a few articles of his as well as his academic profile where you can go and see, read and look into his work in greater detail. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. We don't run advertising in any way on the Korean Art Podcast, and this is a conscious decision, but it also means that we are entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you listen to the podcast, if you like the podcast and you want us to continue, it is important that you do your best to go to the Patreon or PayPal links below and support us however you can. On that and to walk us through the German lessons for Korean reunification, on this, the 30th anniversary of German reunification, this is Sean King. Sean King, welcome back to the Korean Now podcast. Good to be with you. Thanks a lot. So this is our second podcast. We did one together, I guess it was almost a year ago now, when we spoke about the, the summit season that was happening back then. And today is another timely podcast in a way, but we will get to that. Uh, before we get going here, I might get you to introduce your personal interaction with the subject. So we're going to speak about Korean reunification and the lessons or lessons that don't exist between that and uh, the two Germanys. So I might get you to start just with a personal interaction because you have a unique personal story in regard to East Germany. So let's go there first. Yeah, so I'm 50 years old. I'm an Asia specialist. But once upon a time in 1986, 87, when I was 16, I was a high school exchange student in Sweden. And on my spring break, I ended up on a day trip in a Volvo 740 Turbo, of course, playing Europe's The Final Countdown. Uh, Against my wishes, I was actually outvoted. Ended up on a day trip to West Berlin. But this was two and a half years before the wall fell. And uh, of course, to get to West Berlin, you had to drive three or four hours through East Germany. And we were in Hamburg going to Berlin. 
And even though I didn't want to go, once I reached the inner German border, I was blown away and I knew I'd never be the same. So I got hooked on Berlin, hooked on East Germany. I went back again two months later at the end of my year there, twice more before the wall fell. And then in 91, two years after the wall came down and one year after German unification, I did an undergraduate semester abroad in Berlin. I lived in the former West, but had a lot of my lectures and friends in the former East. So the feeling was still very much West and East, but you were free to go back and forth. So it was an ideal time to be there. Since then, I got into Asia and kind of left Berlin behind. Uh, but those memories will always be with me. And that's how I got into it all those years ago. And we will get, I suppose, into some of those details as well as we speak through the, the, the core of what we're going to chat about today. But also, why are we speaking today? I mean, of course, I know and you know, but there is an interesting anniversary right now. And it is a poignant moment to be chatting about this topic. So what is this anniversary that we're speaking about today? Yeah, so in May 89, there were West German, uh, East German local elections where the ruling Communist Party got 98.5% of the vote. And for once, people decided to rise up and under their rights, uh, under East German law, demand a recount. And it was shown that the result was fraudulent. This led to a summer of discontent, uh, which led in conjunction with all the other revolutions happening in Eastern Europe to the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989. And then the next year, October 3rd, 1990, somewhat unexpectedly when the wall fell, uh, but eventually it became clear this is what was going to happen. The two Germanies unified on October 3rd, 1990. I was doing a semester abroad in Brussels. You know, I was always in Europe at this age. And uh, my professor, Yehuda Lukacs, a Hungarian who had actually escaped communism himself, he said, let's cancel classes today and take a bus to Cologne so we can be on German soil for Unification Day. And uh, the only condition was we had to each speak to at least five people on the street and ask them what German unification meant for them and put it in a paper when we got back. So I was actually in Cologne on German soil 30 years ago today when Germany unified. But that's why we're talking. Today is the, the rebirth of the modern German nation as we know it. And as we step into the questions about Korea, and of course, many people, when they do think about this, instinctively go to the question of, of Korean uh, reunification and apply, of course, to that, you know, it, it seems to be this uh, neat analogy. But as we'll speak about, there are a lot of challenges to it. But uh, I might get as a first question, speak about this South Korean fascination, this deep, uh, deep uh, grip on the topic themselves. So it's something that hasn't waned over time, or perhaps it has slightly and come back up a little bit. But it is one of those issues that South Koreans spend an awful lot of time thinking and speaking about. Yeah, unfortunately, because I really consider the situations very different, except for one key point, which a lot of Koreans don't want to face, but we can come back to that toward the end. Mm. And uh, on average, every year, there are at least 500 mentions of German unification in South Korean newspapers. And for some reason in the year 2018, it's uh, topped a thousand. And of course, last year was the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall. So everyone was talking about it again. But I think South Koreans are so uh, distraught over their division with very few examples to look at. And the fact that German unification had a happy ending, they're hoping that could be for them. And also just the fact that both both divisions happened as a result of World War II, where it was Soviet Union on one side and either the United States or the free world on the other. Like you said, it does seem very convenient, uh, but they're really different situations. And also, a lot of the South Korean fascination with German unification tends to be the after the fact logistics, like not necessarily what about unification, but how did they deal with it afterwards? you know, in terms of mm. revitalizing state-owned industries in the East, uh, refugee flows into the West, the rise of the far right in East Germany, which actually was there all the time. We just didn't realize it. Uh, these are kinds of things that preoccupy a lot of South Koreans. A lot of times when they do look at German unification, they think that West Germany's reaching out to the East is what brought it about. But I think that's exactly the wrong lesson to draw. Because uh, if anything, in many ways, West Germany reaching out to the East kept it around longer than it would have been otherwise because it resulted in a lot of West German hard currency going into East Germany. But what brought about German unification was East Germany's collapse. And that's because the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, chose to no longer back it or the other East European states. It was not East Germany making a conscious choice to be closer to West Germany. 
is that they fell apart and then the East German people themselves chose unification. So the lessons for Koreans is not necessarily reaching out to North Korea is going to bring about unification, but North Korea's collapse is going to bring about unification. Now that is an interesting way to, I hadn't thought of it in that way, the way Koreans think about it after the fact like that. And yes, there's going to be a lot of details that we mentioned for the podcast that we'll come back a little later on. And But let's stick on this origins question for just a moment here. Uh, yeah. This there is an interesting point of just how long the two countries, the history of the two countries, but also how long they've been divided for. Uh, I've seen that you've written somewhere that uh, uh, if you think about the, the the two Germanys, they were divided for, 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 not divided, but they were under the dictatorial rule for 56 years. And when we right. think about North Korea today, it's 110 years. And this is significant in itself. There's a problem here about mindsets and challenges, but there's also the origins of the two countries, what, where, where they found themselves after the Second World War. One was a victim, one was a, a perpetrator. One. Is, so let's go to that origins question and why this is such an important starting point. And it's such a big challenge for reunification. Absolutely. I mean, Korea has been a nation, one people for at least a millennium, however you want to define it. So there is one Korean nation and people forever and ever. Uh, Germany, as we know it, only unified in 1871 through Bismarck's blood and iron. It was all these sovereign states and city states. And then it was the perpetrator, the aggressor of World War II. Korea was a victim. Uh, you know, really, Korea got screwed twice. You know, first it's it's occupied by Japan brutally, and then it gets divided like Germany did. A lot of people say, understandably, that Japan should have been divided, not Korea. Uh, and, you know, Germany, both sides were doing whatever they could to be as un-German as possible to atone for the guilt of the war. You know, it wasn't very cool in Europe in the 50s to be German after what happened, uh, especially East Germany. They want to show themselves as a good communist global citizen. Meanwhile, Korea, which had been occupied by Japan, and, and then divided, the two Koreas were fighting to claim the mantle of the one true Korea. They were trying to be as Korean as possible, while the two Germanys were running away from their Germanness. And if you combine the Nazi era with the East German era, which has now been on 30 years and only existed for 40 years, but divisions are still clearly there, even, by, even among people who were born in the East after unification, there's still an East German identity, which has actually had a resurgence in recent years. You're still talking about only 56 years that East Germans lived under totalitarian rule, which as we'll get into was far different than anything experienced in North Korea. But if you take upon Japanese occupation plus the Kim dynasty, you're looking at 110 years and counting, double. So this idea of coming back into the free and open world for North Koreans, socially and politically would be a lot more difficult than it was for East Germans who were much more internationalized than uh, North Koreans ever are. So let's keep launching into some of these lessons here. And of course, one of them must be uh, the Cold War period and the era, that era and the challenges that happened here. And of course, I, I've seen that you've written, and this is interesting, people need to think about this. It, they often imagine that, they often forget that, of course, there's been a war be between the two Koreas. There's something that the that East Germany, West Germany never had. In fact, you write, as a rule, East Germany's, uh, East German forces and agents tried their best not to kill West German uh, Correct. forces and citizens and then of course there's a, even after the korean war there's this whole litany of engagements where north korean agents and north korean spies and soldiers have killed south koreans and this is deliberate assassination not some accident well as we'll talk about later i mean north korean communism is not really communism it's a ultra it's a korean ultra nationalism East germans were communists who happened to be german but they saw themselves at the forefront of the world global communist movement. And East Germany housed and aided and abetted terrorist groups from all over the world. Biedermannhof, Carlos the Jackal, uh, Libyans, different groups, they all set up shop in East Germany, got assistance. The PLO even had an office in downtown East Berlin. Yasser Arafat visited the East German parliament, the Volkskammer. Uh, but as a rule, East German forces and agents and the Shazi, the secret police, never attacked or killed West Germans. Meanwhile, North Korea, when it was on, then off, and now thankfully on again, the U.S. state sponsor of terrorism list, they almost only attack South Koreans. Thinking of the Rangoon bombing, the Korean Airlines uh, bombing in 87. 
So totally different. East Germans did not attack West Germans, and there was never a war between the two. Again, the Koreas were sort of driving this as the true inheritors of the Korean Peninsula. East and West Germany were in alliances. They were basically following Moscow and Washington in this global clash in the Cold War. West Germany was in NATO. East Germany was in the Warsaw Pact. They were dutiful global client states with very little agency of their own. They did versus each other and versus East European states. But in the big picture, uh, they were really part of a global clash where North and South Korea are pretty much exclusively a Korean clash. And of course, an important question in that is also how the two uh, countries and the two regions have responded to the histories of these of conflicts. Now, of course, uh, the Germans after the Second World War were very, very keen to pay reparations and to uh, um, in, in some way try to absolve some of not the guilt, but the shame of that past they acknowledged a lot and they've had a lot of outreach there. But after the, after the Korean War has happened, uh, you still have North Korea claiming that they were the ones invaded. And there was a really rare moment yesterday, uh, 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 last week, when Kim Jong-un apologized for an assassination of a diplomat that ended up in North Korea somehow. It's, it's murky, but it's rare because North Koreans never apologized for anything. Right. Uh, East Germans, in some ways, had history on their side because they were able, many of their leaders like Eric Honecker, Walter Ulbricht, the people who would end up leading East German were committed communists who were either in jail or in exile during the Nazi era. And then Moscow put them in charge afterwards when there was still hope of a united Germany under either system. Uh, and they wanted, they, Eric Honecker, the final leader of East Germany was actually from what was West Germany. And some committed communists from the West actually moved to the East in the immediate years after the wall before they realized the reality of what the system would end up becoming. So East Germany paid war reparations, West Germany paid war reparations. The Soviet Union dismantled much of East German industry and factories, what was left after the war, and moved to the Soviet Union. And Germany itself lost a third of its territory into Poland and other East European states. So uh, Germany had to pay its dues and then Korea was a victim, and obviously North Korea completely uh, tells a false history that the United States invaded North Korea, even though there were no U.S. troops for the most, except for a few hundred advisors, there were no U.S. troops in South Korea when the Korea War broke out, which is why the North invaded. Uh, and as far as that apology letter, I don't really consider it an apology letter. I think Kim just wants to stay on Moon's good side to make sure his promises of aid and assistance keep coming, especially as Moon disappears pointing the stops uh, leaflets and broadcasts over the DMZ. Uh, but I, I don't really, for someone who's killed his own uncle and half brother, I don't think Kim is really showing any true remorse. Well, we see that apology in the same way then. Um, let's also step forward into a, a really interesting question here, because as you said, a lot of South Koreans, when they look at North Korea and they talk about reunification, they really are looking about the after effects of it. So let's talk about uh, population and geography and the sizes of the two countries, because of course, this is South Koreans and not imagining reunification, they're imagining an, an absorption of sorts. So they're going to take on an, a, an, a, a system from North Korea, they're going to take on the population, they're going to take on the land mass. But this is a very, very different situation what happened in uh, East Germany, simply based on the number of people, but also the size of the countries involved. Yeah, North Korea's landmass is larger than South Korea's, even though South Korea's population is larger than the North's. Uh, but West Germany, you know, you had 64 million people in the West and only 16 million people in the East. So uh, it was much bigger where the West was really just taking on a piece and it was still an incredibly difficult process. Uh, and yet yeah, I would assume that Korean unification would be an absorption. Hopefully it's the South absorbing the North and not the North absorbing the South. That would be a nightmare. Uh, but you know, you know, we have to also remember that Koreans on both sides of the DMZ talk about unification as the end goal. Now, I know there are some people in the South who say it's not worth the cost. I don't believe that. I believe that when they are confronted with the opportunity to unite, the Koreans will jump at it and take a once in a lifetime opportunity. As I remember it, just being some teenage punk running around West Berlin in the 80s, I rarely have ever heard a West German talk about German reunification. And in the East, it was you know, strictly verboten to mention it at all. And 
you know, my outside view of it, semi outside, was that the uprising in East Germany in 1989 was not about unification. That only came a few months after the fact. It was about making East Germany a better place, a better socialist state, a more open country. Because remember, North Koreans cannot even, for the most part, visit mainland China or Russia. But East Germans, uh, by and large, could visit other East European and communist countries. The only countries they could visit without a visa were Poland and Czechoslovakia. But Poland was cut off after the Solidarity Movement. But so long as they applied for a visa, East Germans can go to Cuba, they can go to the Soviet Union, they could go to mainland China, uh, go to Hungary. For, for most East German teenagers, the big trip was their trip, their high school trip to Hungary, where they could buy Western records and Adidas sneakers and U2 12 inches and the like. But it also showed them that just because you were a socialist country didn't mean you have to be totally closed. You could be somewhat open. So East Germans look not only at West Germany as a model of what they wanted, but also more open countries like Hungary. It was only afterwards when they got out and they flowed into the West, they saw how much richer the West was, how kaput their own country was, that unification uh, became a thing. But up until February 13th, 1990, which was, you know, three months after the wall fell, the East German finance minister was still making proposals to West German, West Germany for foreign aid to East Germany to shore up the East German economy. It wasn't until March of 1990 that monetary union was mentioned. So unification was kind of a, an afterthought given circumstances, but not the driving force. In Korea, I think it would be about unification from the start. And we should mention something here that with all these years that have passed, it's often forgotten by people or just the location of what we're speaking about here. So uh, West Germany, uh, sorry, uh, East, uh, West Berlin is this little piece of West Germany deep inside Eastern Germany. And this is an interesting part here. And I know that you've written about this as well. And you write something along the lines of, uh, yeah, I have it in front of me here. Sorry. Eastern Berlin is saw West Berlin every day just over the Berlin Wall on their way to school and work. You, you, you write that they, they could hear Dave, David, David Bowie's outdoor concert. They could, uh, they could see billboards, for, for example. And this is a remarkable difference to North and South Korea, of course, and a really big difference towards uh, potential reunification because, of course, you're dealing with two countries that uh, are struggling to fully understand what is going to come their way. But, of course, when, it, when you're talking about the two Germanys, there's much more interaction there if, if, it's, if, if it's only superficial, of course. Yeah. So, you know, just like Germany was divided into four sectors, the city of Berlin was divided into four sectors of occupation. But it was it fully inside the Soviet zone. So when West Germany formed as a nation in 1949, it was West Germany that formed first through currency union, currency union of the Deutschmark because the East German Soviet zone wasn't yet ready to join. So it was the French, British, and American sectors that formed West Germany, and East Germany soon followed. The three sectors in the West associated themselves with West Germany. Now, technically, West Berlin was not part of West Germany, but for all intents and purposes, it was. They had West German immigration at the uh, airport, and they used West German Deutsche Marks. But, you know, if you were in West Berlin, you didn't have to serve in the military and all these different things. And East Berlin technically was not part of East Germany, but East Germany made it so. So, you know, we had West Berlin police on the west side of the wall, but they had East German national troops at the east side of the wall in violation of this special status of Berlin. And the U.S. Embassy in East Berlin that opened in 1974 after the two Germanys recognized each other in 1972, we called it the East German, uh, the U.S. Embassy to East Germany, not in East Germany, because we didn't recognize East Berlin as actually a part of East Germany. Uh, but yeah, so you had, for all intents and purposes, a slice of West Germany deep inside communist East Germany. And the wall was only four, four and a half meters high. And I would off, I visited East Berlin twice, downtown East Berlin before the wall fell. I would be on above ground S-Bahn subways or railways with East Germans, watching them look at West Berlin, thinking, what are they thinking that they can't go over there? And they could see Coca-Cola billboards, they could see BMWs, they could see all this stuff. And the Reichstag, which was the former German parliament building that Hitler burned down to seize power in 33, which is now again, the United German Bundestag, where Angela Merkel sits, uh, that field there was used for concerts. David Bowie, Pink Floyd, and 
1987, in June, there were riots in East Berlin because David Bowie called fans to the wall to come and hear the music and the East German cops stopped them. So just imagine knowing how cut off North Korea is. Imagine if you had a South Pyongyang where yes. as students are on their way to Kim Il-sung Square to chant against American imperialism, they just happen to look over a wall and see the latest Hyundai sedan or K-pop billboard. Because West Berlin, I was there a lot. You know, once you got past the wall, you felt like you were in any other West German or West European city. Every band would come there. Depeche Mode recorded three albums there. You buy any product. You had West German soccer, Hertha Berlin. You had major tournaments, every conferences. It was just like another West European city. Uh, but the idea of like a part of free South Korea inside North Korea is mind boggling. Also, the two Germanys uh, had a lot more travel between them. Uh, I don't know if you want to get into this later or not, but when the two Germanys formally recognized each other in 1972, they started allowing 40,000 East Germans a year to go to the West and senior citizens, pensioners could always go no matter what. And by the mid eighties to sort of let some air out of the bubble, East Germany decided to let half a million people go a year. So long as they left a family member home as ransom. And in the final year before the wall fell, like, 2 million East Germans visited West Germany and came home. So by the time German unification happened, even the night the wall fought, fell, already 25% of the East German population had at least visited West Germany. They knew what was going on, uh, as opposed to North Koreans who have no idea what's happening outside their borders. So as we begin to build up this picture of the two uh, reunifications, or at least one potential reunification here, and it feels like we may be uh, 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 dampening the spirits of some people that hope for it, or at least hope that it's going to be easy. The most important point, at least for me, I'm not sure how you see it here, is going to be ideology. And often, sadly, inside South Korea, it's often one of those points that is most, that is, that is it's most commonly missed and brushed over by people, despite how deeply foundational it must be and of course this is really important when you compare the case of the of course Germany and South Korea this is an East Germany uh, that were uh, very uh, in they were internationalist in some way they were very anti-nationalist um, very much and, so. and they looked towards I didn't realize this until reading through some of your research that they actually looked towards West Germany and they looked at West Germany's as at West Germany as the inheritor of Nazism and they held that against them that we are so fundamentally different to you in this way so anti-racist anti-nationalist and I might get to contrast this particular view with just the challenges that are now facing uh, um, Korea in terms of the deep, deep uh, race-based nationalism inside North Korea. Aside from the openness, this would be the most important critical difference between the two situations. So, like I said, East German leaders, a lot of them had credibility because they went to jail during the Nazi era. They were anti-German. They were anti-nationalist. Uh, in 1974, East Germany amended its Article 8 of the Constitution, deleted the words Germany and German nation from its constitution and said it was forever and ever against reunification and forever loyal to the Soviet Union and had this policy of Abgrenzung, like demarcation or separation. Uh, and it was very, very international. They saw it being German as a problem. So East Germany was very open to other communist countries. So on these rest stops to and from West Berlin to Hamburg, you would get off. Uh, and of course, if you wanted to tank up your car, West, West Germans and Westerners had to pay with Western currency and East Germans could use Eastern currency. But there would be magazines and books from all over the East Bloc for sale, you know, from Bulgaria, from Hungary, from the Soviet Union, Sputnik, whatever. There was none of this East German or German nationalism whatsoever. It was a very internationalist, multinational state. And they encouraged and welcomed foreigners from all socialist countries to live and study in East Germany. So there were thousands, if not millions, over the years of Africans, Europeans, Asians, South Americans from socialist countries and friendly parties and organizations who came to live and work in East Germany. And they were against all race-based conditions to marriage or interaction or friendship. For them, socialism and the global ideology of the working class trumped everything else, including religion, race color, what have you. There were even cases where uh, students from other countries would come to East Germany, fall in love with an East German, the couple wanted to get married, and the country from where the person came, their embassy would 
intervene to stop the marriage, saying it's not appropriate. But the East German authorities, in more than one case, would say, sorry, but they ha- if they want to get married, we, we encourage it because this will like, help bridge the gaps of socialism among people across the world and spread the socialist ideals. So they were very idealistic. Now, most of East Germany was Prussia, which was the heart of Nazism. And there were a lot of racist sentiments on the ground. Researchers recently found over 8,000 documented cases in Stasi archives of racist attacks against foreigners on East German soil. And there was resentment among East Germans toward these foreigners because for the most part, these foreigners while living in East Germany were free to visit the West. Like a lot of Vietnamese guest workers, for instance, who worked in East German factories, they could go to West Berlin on their days off. Their governments didn't care. Uh, And for them, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was just, they were in Germany. They didn't really care whether they were East or West, but they went to the West to buy things they couldn't get in the East. So there was this resentment and this inherent racism in the society, but East Germany did not want to uh, glorify this or even mention it publicly, often because the perpetrators were the children of party officials, but also would go against this idea that East Germany was the only anti-fascist state and that West Germany was the inheritor of Nazism. And any time some ex-Nazi would turn up in a West German government position, East Germany would trumpet to the hilt and say, see, they haven't repented like we have. They totally disassociated themselves from Germany's Nazi past. Meanwhile, as you know, North Korea is a race-based xenophobic ideology that you know uh, talks about foreign troops and foreign blood and foreign soil in South Korea, talks down intermarriage, and is just a very xenophobic, inward-looking thing that just focuses on Koreanness and Koreanism. When East German, East Germany was forced to explain why East Germans were poorer than West Germans, they would tell their people, well, a lot of West Germans are richer, but that's because they don't take care of the poor. You know, it's typical communist stuff. But North Korea tells its people South Koreans are richer than the North because uh, they've outsourced their sovereignty to American troops. They've forsaken their Koreanness. Because they've outsourced their sovereignty and defense to the Yankee devil, they can then get rich and make money. So it's totally different, very anti-communist view that North Korea has. And it's also, uh, it goes a lot to motivations as well here. Um, that is so important what you just said there. I, I do hope most people, more people pay attention to it. Because uh, as you said there in East Germany, the impetus for reunification from the East German side was as much as anything, this uh, uh, socialist internationalist model of the world. They wanted to incorporate there with German brothers and sisters. No, not because they're German, but because they wanted to incorporate everybody into this worldview. But the push for reunification uh, from both South and North Korea, but, spe- uh, but much more so from North Korea, is always this line of, of, of race. And when you listen to North Koreans and North Korean media and propaganda, they speak endlessly about this. They speak about the final victory. And this is what animates the Kim dynasty, this idea that we must we must reunify, not because we are, we are a divided country or we are a divided nation in some way, but because we are a divided race. Yeah, the main thing is that this idea of Korean race nationalism came about when Korea was occupied by Japan and German nationalism, unlike French and English nationalism, which is more on society and values, is also based on race. And it, too, came late, German nationalism in the late 19th century. So both Korean and German nationalisms were late to the nationalist game, and they both are based on culture, ethnicity, and race, although East Germans themselves have disavowed this. And if you look back at the Stasi archives, they were tracking North Korea very closely because their diplomats in Pyongyang were cabling home, very worried about what was happening in North Korea, saying that Kim Il-sung was writing Soviet Union's rescue in North Korea out of its history and taking down statues of Soviet heroes and generals in Pyongyang. And that North Korean diplomats in East Germany were going around spreading the word of Kim Il-sung and Korean nationalism and not talking about communism and socialism. The Stasi was very closely monitoring North Korean diplomats in East Germany, infiltrating their embassy, their events. They even banned some North Korean publications in East Germany. And uh, I guess they, you know, they, a true sellout in early 1989, before the revolution started, they even let Samsung open an office (laughs) in East Berlin. So uh, relations were not good.
Yes. Oh, well, let's stick on that point for a moment, this idea of independence. And North Korea boasts loudly about their independence. Of course, it's very questionable and, of course, uh, highly problematic over the years. They like to claim independence when they're often not. But it is something that they stick to, at least internally, tell themselves this. But, of course, this is incredibly different to way East, to way East Germany behave. Of course, you, you, I've seen you right here that there's 380,000 Soviet troops in East Germany when the Berlin Wall fell. And, of course, this is uh, contrasted when you think about even someone like Jang Song Tech, Kim Jong Un's father, who, uh, sorry, um, uncle, who, of course, is speculated, but many people speculate that he was in fact assassinated because he was becoming too close to China. Which, of course, uh, if China are the problem here, then it's a challenge for North Korea because they have very few other friends in the world. But I might get to stop and pause and talk about those two questions of independence and how perhaps uh, this makes East Germany so much more ready for reunification than uh, North Korea are. Yeah, I mean, East Germany saw themselves as a dutiful client state of the Soviet Union. They even, when North Korea amends its co uh, constitution to put in Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il, East Germany amends its constitution to put in the Soviet Union. When Yuri Gagarin was the cosmonaut in space, there was a victory parade for him in East Berlin. Uh, there are a lot of old East German TV shows available on YouTube, and there's one called Um die Ecke around the corner about a policeman's family and it shows a school trip where they go to visit the Yuri Gagarin statue in East Berlin. I remember seeing when I lived in Berlin, it was only two years after. So a lot of the East German stuff was still up. I saw like jungle gyms and children's playgrounds, and kindergartens, and the rocket said CCCP. They celebrated Soviet and other communist countries achievements as if they were own. There weren't statues of German communists around town. There were statues of Lenin on the, on the city square. And uh, they wanted to be, they were trying to prove themselves how pro-Soviet they were. And Eric Honecker, the final leader, when he overthrew Walter Ulbricht, his predecessor, he actually went to Moscow to organize the coup. So East German politicians, if you want to call them politicians, they would compete with each other to be closer to Moscow, to be more international, to be more of a Soviet friend, was actually a leg up or a career advancement in East Germany. Meanwhile, after de-Stalinization, you had Pravda and Rodin and Simbong editorializing against each other and purging of any of the Soviet Koreans who came back with Kim Il-sung because they may bring foreign influence. But East Germany was just the opposite. And they had so 380,000 troops, Soviet troops on East German soil and Soviet nuclear weapons. And they were happy. They were proud of it. They wanted to be a dutiful assistant. When Poland became unreliable through the Solidarity Movement, East Germany actually built a special secret harbor for military depot on its eastern coast so that the Soviet military could supply it by sea from Lithuania, what was would become an independent Lithuania around Poland. And you had these MiG planes, which I once saw do maneuvers in the sky in East Germany on the frontier. It was the Soviet Union's most important client state because it was on the frontier with a Western NATO power, West Germany. Hungary and Czechoslovakia ordered West Germany to, a bit. Czechoslovakia did, but otherwise Austria, which was neutral. But East Germany was right there up against West German NATO, and the Soviet Union prized it very much. So a flow-on effect from that question of ideology that we mentioned earlier. Um, it is uh, it, it makes perfect sense when you think about it in this way, that um, you write about East Germany and West Germany, and of course we're East, East Germany right, are much freer to engage West Germany and the West in general, so this idea of access in Western and international information of course, we all know instinctively how little international inf information gets into North Korea, but of course a lot of this comes about because North Koreans have this idea that they are the one true Korea, and therefore you cannot let information of another Korea filter into a country here, so I might you have a touch on that question of Western um, uh, information, international information coming into the two countries and yeah. why East Germany was so ready for it in a way that North Korea just are going to find themselves very difficult to, be, to get in that position? Well, even before it opened up to West Germany, East Germany was totally open up to other communist countries. So, you know, people were already watching Hungarian TV and reading Soviet books, which may not sound like the most exciting stuff, but... There, it was not closed off to the rest of the socialist world. But since East Germany didn't really want to be German, didn't really care about being German, and saw Germany as part of the problem, they had no claim They had no claim to West Germany. They didn't care. To them, West Germany was just another corrupt bourgeois capitalist country 
uh, and they might as well ride, take it for all it's worth on its way down. So in night and West Germany, and this is another big thing, uh, you know, a, a lot of people mistake what was West Germany's Ostpolitik or Eastern policy for what was South Korea's Nordpolitik and later Sunshine policy toward the North. And as a result, as an end game in Ostpolitik, the two Germanys ended up recognizing each other in 1972. You know, West Germany thought if they brought East Germany in, they could integrate it, infiltrate it. And West Germany, they uh, renounced their own Hallstein doctrine, which is sort of what Beijing follows with Taiwan today, saying that if you have diplomatic relations with Taipei, you can't have diplomatic relations with the PRC. That's how the two Germanys were until 1972. But then West Germany said, you can have relations with East Germany and still have relations with us. We'll accept two German states within one German nation. Uh, but Ostpolitik, the real point of it was West Germany making peace with other East European countries, most notably Poland. So there was always fear that if Germany united, that a united Germany would not accept the redrawn border between Poland and what was then East Germany, the oder nysa line. And Willy Brandt, the Chancellor of West Germany, Social Democrat, he accepted the oder nysa line as Germany's easternmost border and also started trading more with Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and the Soviet Union. That then allowed the Soviet Union to look the other way when East and West Germany got to know each other better. But it wasn't, it was a European play. It was a European story of which East Germany was a part. Nor politique by contrast, was exclusively about Seoul opening relations with Beijing and Moscow just for the express purpose of getting to Pyongyang. But because East Germany didn't have this German dream, they were happy to look at West Germany as just another country. And one of the demands that West Germany made for recognition and assistance was greater openness. And this is another disappointment with South Korea. There's never a human rights or informational pay for whenever a nationalist left government in Seoul gives assistance to the North. So in 1972, they recognized each other. In 1973, East Germany stopped jamming or stopped, started selling the correct antennas so that East Germans could watch West German TV. And about 70% of East Germans got West German TV until the fall of the Berlin Wall. In fact, the, po the two pockets that couldn't get the West German signal uh, in East German slang, they were called the Valley of the Clueless. And there were even stories of East German party officials wouldn't accept reassignment if they were going to a part of the country where they couldn't watch West German TV. And the failing New York Times, as President Trump likes to call it, <laughs> I found a 1984 report, a New York Times article from a correspondent who went into East Berlin. And he was on the East Berlin subway and he overheard two East German women sh gossiping about who really shot JR in Dallas. So that's how closely East Germans were consuming uh, Western media. But more important than that, they could see the glitz and the glamour in West Germany. They could also see West German media holding West German leaders to account. And they could see the debate between different sides because you had a lot of very contentious issues in West Germany at the time. Uh, you had asylum issues, obviously, but also you had nuclear power, the stationing of the Pershing two missiles, uh, European integration at different stages. So they would see debates, they would see elections, they would see West Germans arguing with each other and the officials being held to account. Most importantly, West Germany reported critically on events in East Germany. So there were West German reporters stationed in East Germany as foreign correspondents. Now their movements were limited, but dissidents would feed them scoops and they would get stuff out, come back to West Germany and report what they saw. So to find out what was really going on in their own country, East Germans would watch West German news, which is actually how they found out the Berlin Wall was open. Mm. Uh, but there's no equivalent of that in North Korea. So they, it was so permeable. Not only did East Germans have access to media and entertainment from all over the socialist world, but they also had it from West Germany, which most critically, they got real coverage of their own country. And I really like that point there, and I've seen it, you've written about it a few times, and just how interesting that one is about uh, the messiness of democracy. We often sit here and lament how messy our democracies are, but when the East Germans were seeing it, they were seeing the mess and thinking, I would like to be able to criticize my own government in that way. It may feel a le lot less clean, but it's actually that criticism that's so attractive. And that 
takes us into the next question. And this is a broad question. I know it's going to be a challenge, but we've touched on some of the issues in terms of freedom of movement and travel and information, etc. But what were the human rights landscapes like in uh, North Korea and East Germany? And what were the differences? Well, you know all about North Korea, how, how close that is. And uh, most notably, you know, if anybody commits a political crime in North Korea, you have multiple generations of the same family going to jail, even dismissing the leaders or not taking care of the portraits in the house or watching a South Korean DVD. Obviously, you couldn't get in trouble that for that in East Germany because West German TV was legal. But East Germany signed different human rights conventions and the Helsinki Accords because they basically had to do whatever the Soviet Union did. So when, you know, the Soviet Union didn't follow through on all these things, but at least they signed, the, they signed these accords and they went through the motions. So East Germany had signed these documents and, you know, promised freedom of travel and they could travel freely among other East European countries and also travel freely within East Germany. And you know, they had 250,000 political prisoners over the course of the, the country and about a thousand people died trying to escape either at the Berlin Wall or to West Germany. You know, even uh, East German tourists were sometimes shot trying to escape from Bulgaria to Greece, for which East Berlin paid the Bulgarian government money for every East German tourist they shot. But it was nothing compared to what happened uh, in North Korea. And really what was refreshing is that West German governments left and right, even though they didn't talk that much about unification, they always made East German human rights, which is kind of a loaded term, but let's just say they made East German human rights their primary goal. So every time any assistance was given from West to East, there had to be a human rights concession from the East. So first it was TV, then it was the 40,000 year people who were allowed to go. For another bank guarantee, East Germany had to move, remove the automatic weaponry on the rural inner German border. Another time they got assistance, they had to uh, take down, you know, West Germans, millions of West Germans visited East Germany, and I, I went four times myself. So they earned a boatload of hard currency from these transits through East Germany to West Berlin and, and visits within East Germany. But uh, West Germany said, you know, if we're going to do, if we're going to give you aid and assistance, you have to reduce the currency requirements of people going into the East so that more can get over and there can be more interaction. And they had school exchanges, they had trips, obviously more East Germans came to West Germany toward the end. So West Germany was always pushing for as much person-to-person German-German contact as possible. And in a population of 16 million, when the Berlin Wall fell, 3.5 million East Germans, one way or another, had already resettled in West Germany. The West Germany would also buy political prisoners. It was said that East Germany's leading currency uh, export some years was people. People would get arrested on purpose for a political crime only to have their freedom bought by West Germany for about 300,000 US dollars a piece. Uh, so if you're looking at the population difference, you have 3.5 million people from the East who resettle in the West and only 29,000 North Korean defectors have made it to the South. When you account for size, there's about 400 times as many East Germans were in West Germany at the time of unification as there are North Koreans in South right now. Uh, and the West German government, left or right, was always pushing East German human rights, which sadly I can't say the same thing for South Korean governments, especially on the left. Well, let's, um, let's pause on that question because that is a really important one here. The diff- People often think about the differences between North Korea and East Germany. When in many ways, we should be often thinking about the differences between South Korea and West Germany. And so let's pause on that moment of the behavior of South Korean governments and how they've reached out to the North with that last answer of yours in mind, of course. And this brings us to so many recent presidents, but of course, we should focus on Moon Jae-in because he at least is in the present moment here with us. And this idea idea that South Korean presidents and him in particular from the left think uh, have this uh, feel inside them that if they just don't speak about human rights, if they just offer unconditional help and assistance to North Korea, that this is the way to do it without any uh, step back. And I'm not sure how you see this or how you feel about this, but this seems to step in very struck, uh, uh, strong contrast to the way really, really, West Germany yeah, behaves. Yeah, re- Really disappointing because I see Moon stopping the leaflets over the border, uh, stopping the broadcasts. If any West German chancellor, left or right, had even talked about that, 
uh, they would have been immediately sacked or maybe even arrested. You know, it would be treason. How could you do such a thing to our cousins in the East? Uh, they were always pushing the envelope, West Germany was. I remember my first visit to Berlin, just walking down uh, Zimmerstraße in the American sector near Checkpoint Charlie, and there was some guy with a homemade rock and roll amp that had a loudspeaker going into East Berlin, and he gave me the mic. He said, anything you want to say to our friends in the East? So there I was just walking down, some, you know, some jerk on the street, giving a microphone to speak to into East Berlin. So, uh, yeah, totally different. And also South Korea after the war was, you know, let's be honest, a right wing dictatorship with a, an American elite put in power. West Germany, from the moment of its creation in 1949, was a model citizen when it came to democracy, human rights, and eventually in 1955 became a core member of the NATO alliance. So it was part of a multinational democratic struggle against communism, uh, deeply entrenched with, uh, you know, Washington, Paris, and London, as opposed to South Korea, which didn't democratize until way later in the late '80s and had its own its own issues at home and was not part of any multinational alliance, which I think the U.S. didn't want because, as Victor Chow says in his book Power Play, we didn't want to have an Asian version of NATO. Because we didn't want Syngman Rhee or Chiang Kai-shek to try and finish, provoke a finishing to their unification wars and then drag us into it. Because every West European leader, the last thing they wanted was a war with Eastern Europe. And Konrad Adenauer, the, the first chancellor of West Germany, when he chose the sleepy little village of Bonn as the capital, he had no interest in East Germany or anything to come from there. Rumor is he chose Bonn because on a map it was closer to Paris than Berlin. So... You know, we didn't want to get wrapped up on all that in Eastern Europe. But yeah, really disappointing how South Korean leaders, especially on the left, just don't want to talk about this issue or want to offend. Even communists and socialists in West Germany hated the East German regime. They thought it was a bastardization of socialism because, you know, every all the parties started out in a united Germany before the split. And there was the Communist Party of Germany, the KPD, and then there were the Social Democrats. And in the East, the communists forcibly took over the Social Democrats, purged them, and then formed the SED, which was the Socialist Unity Party. So obviously, political people on the center-right, CDU, which was Helmut Kohl's party, Angela Merkel's party now, they didn't like communists. But I found among West Germans, the people who hated the communists most were Social Democrats because of what the communists had done to the Social Democrats in East Germany by forcing them into their party. So there was no love, no tolerance, no sympathy whatsoever uh, for East Germany in the West, even if the people were left-leaning themselves, the way you do find some sympathy on South Korea's extreme nationalist left for the Kim dynasty. So uh, I, might, I might pause on that question for just a moment there. That, um, because we seem to be in agreement, me and you, about this is a mistake by Moon Jae-in, and other presidents in the past have done it as well. I wonder why you think he is doing it, because it has some popular support inside South Korea. I mean, I've bumped into people on the streets who often say, you just got to make friends with them any way you can. And they seem to have this idea that as long as you just uh, outreach and don't ask any questions, you, you, you would do well here. So I wonder why you think think that's become such a popular idea in South Korea because your first impulse would be that one from uh, West Germany of if we are going to outreach and give you something to prop up your dynasty and your regime we are going to uh, demand something back but South Korea rarely do and they forgive so many slights and uh, uh, behavior that is much worse than slights the idea of assassinations and uh, and killing of soldiers for example but uh, I wonder why you think the South Korean left are so keen to do this I think is the fact that some people, especially on the fringes, are sympathetic to the ideology in the North. This idea of uh, Korean uh, Korea, separate, whole, distinct from others, and we're all we're all distinct, we're all separate. But I think there are uh, elements on the far left in South Korea that are actually sympathetic to North Korean ideology and blame us, i.e., the United States, for the situation. And that's really unfortunate. What I'd rather see is if you got to give the North money, which I wish they wouldn't, but if they do. For every K song or for every check or humanitarian project that goes up there, I'd like to see maybe uh, Moon demand of Kim that they allow South Korean TV or allow internet or allow 10,000 North Koreans to come to the South or maybe have family reunions in a third country like Beijing. You know, North Korea is never going to agree to it, 
But these are the kinds of things that West Germany demanded and got each time for the most part. I'd like to see Moon at least try these things. You know, every time a South Korean president goes to Germany, they make some speech about us politique and German unification of the model. Well, I'd like to see them do it for once. Why not make these demands? Let North Korea say no and the world see Kim for who he is. But at least try. Sadly, they don't. Let's step into a question that you touched on briefly when we first started the podcast. And this is this um, <clears throat> thought in South Korea that reunification and they often think about the after effects of it. But you mentioned at the very start that very few people in if you ask people Germans today of were you expecting reunification, you're going to find very few people that said, yes, we saw it coming. And very few people spoke about it. It seems to be this inevitable division. And yet in South Korea, it's the opposite. It's like this inevitable moment where we're going to reunify. So how do these two views of the world affect each, each other? And why does one make it so much difficult, uh, much more difficult for potential reun reunification than the other? Well, a lot of Germans felt that they deserved to be divided because of the sins of their country. And, uh, you know, my last trip to East Germany was six months before the Berlin Wall fell, and I noticed nothing. I now, in retrospect, saw a few things that make sense based on what happened later, but at the time, I didn't really notice anything different. And after the wall fell, there was no talk of unification. It was only later on. And then Helmut Kohl, the chancellor of West Germany, he was facing re-election in December of 1990, and he was not riding that high in the polls. So he knew that most people, if he brought hard currency, West German, Deutschmark, and goods and consumer goods to the East and gave them unification, that they would thank him for it. And he thought his party would do very well in the East, which they did. So Cole, for his own politically opportunistic, I'm not saying he didn't want to unify, but he also had a political imperative to do it to win re-election in December 1990, which he did. Also, there was the thought that East Germans now, with no wall, were free to flow into the West, and that if West Germany did not bring West Germany to the East through unification, then pretty soon all of East Germany was going to be in the West anyway. So the only way to save the territory of East Germany was actually to get rid of the state and try to make it more like West Germany. Uh, but really, it was, it was an accident, and people never saw it coming. Uh, and this is just... Is part of it is the fact that Germany united late and that they felt guilty about their role in the war and they really didn't feel the need for a greater German nation. They sort of, you know, things were fine the way they were, so long as people in the East could be free. But Korea rightly thinks it's been wronged by history, uh, not once but twice. And they obviously, there's still a struggle going on, not between communism and democracy, but between whose version of Korea is the right one. So that's a very different situation. And I think a lot of Koreans studying Germany, they start at the end. You know, they see what happened and then work their way back, thinking it was always going to be like this. But being a child of the Cold War, nobody ever expected this to happen, or at least not what it did. So they don't look at a lot of the uh, steps that led up to it. They sort of just look at the glory at the end. So what are some of the hard lessons that, that may come from this? If, uh, if you're talking to a South Korean today with hopes of reunification, what would you tell them to be the hard lessons that their country should, uh, their country, their civic organizations, their, you know, all, all, all manner of institutions across the country, what should they be doing to try and uh, open that door uh, for uh, a potential reunification in the future? Well, I'd say two tough things and one positive thing. The <laughs> tough thing is at any opportunity, push North Korean freedom and human rights. Anytime there's a talk of any assistance or any cooperation with North, unequivocally demand no negotiation, some human rights concession from the North. The more that North Korean citizens and South Korean citizens, even if it's in third countries, can meet, the better. Uh, that said, what really destroyed East Germany was Mikhail Gorbachev. And he visited East Berlin in October 89 for the 40th anniversary of East Germany. And there were students demonstrating for him. By then, uh, East Germany had actually banned the Soviet magazine Sputnik because it was considered too progressive and open with the glasnost and perestroika. So East German students saw Gorbachev as their hope for a better East Germany. And this was only a few months after the Tiananmen Square massacre. So no, but there was even talk of a Chinese solution in East Germany, whether or not they would put the demonstrators down with guns. And Gorbachev came out on the street in East Berlin and he was asked, you know, what, they said, help, help us, help us. And Gorbachev 
which has famous saying, and this is the English translation, said every country has to find its own way. Now, somebody could say that means East Germany is free to mow down the students in the streets. But what it really meant, how it was interpreted was, is that if, if East Germany cracks down on the demonstrators, they're on their own and we're not going to support them. And we're just ready to pull the plug and let go. Uh, that is what collapsed East Germany. That is what made German unification possible, an afterthought that it was. Sadly, so long as North Korea can lean on Beijing for money, uh, weapons, assistance, support, all its illegal business, it's never going to change. So really, the problem here, as I see it, is mainland China. So we also have to get serious about Kim's mainland Chinese enablers, which means sanctioning the banks that handle Kim's finances. So you got to have as much human contact as possible, demand human rights reform in North Korea, and basically pressure China to let North Korea go, because that's the only thing that's going to happen. That said, despite the separation, because uh, we know defectors who make it to the South, even the ones who risk their lives to get out of North Korea, they still think the United States started the Korean War. That's how indoctrinated they are. I'm a lot more bullish on a future United Korea economically than I am was on a Germany. Because, you know, North Koreans, in lieu of a functioning state, especially with the private markets, have built much of what exists in their country with their bare hands. And they've been through a lot. They've suffered a lot. And I just think that they would grab it and Korea would find itself smack dab in the middle of the most economically dynamic region of the world, Northeast Asia. And you have a strong economy in South Korea, just as Germany unified, Germany was entering this, was in Eurosclerosis and going into this like economic downturn from which it's never fully recovered. Based on the fad debacle in 2016, where South Korean companies were punished uh, in China for letting the U.S. have the anti-missile defense shield in the South, I could see a lot of South Korean companies relocating their mainland Chinese operations into what was North Korea, you know, as a sort of pay patriotic duty so they wouldn't fall afoul of mainland Chinese politics in the future and still get cheaper costs in the North. Also, East Germany was immediately uh, made a part of the European Union, or then it was called the European Community, NATO, and all of West Germany's trade agreements. I would assume North Korea would immediately be part of South Korea's free trade agreements with the European Union and the United States. So economically, I am much more bullish long term on a united Korea than I am on a united Germany. That's the good news. But socially and politically, I think the uh, the hurdles would be much higher to overcome. Um, if that's the upside and some of the positives there, let's talk a little bit just as we end this podcast on uh, some of the challenges there. Now, you mentioned a couple of times that you think South Koreans would jump at the chance for reunification, and the polls tend to show that they will. But I wonder what you think are some of the unexpected downsides that South Koreans don't imagine here. Of course, it's going to cost them a bit, and South Koreans don't like to pay taxes, so things like that will challenge them. But you've written once, and I thought this was an interesting thought that South Koreans should keep in mind, at least about their current behavior before any reunification. And you're right, um, when reunification comes, hopefully under Seoul's rule, North Koreans will know that they, were, that, that they weren't forgotten when the country was divided. Now, that's an interesting thought there, because if you, reunification happens by some chance collapse of the Kim dynasty or an internal faction, there's also the risk that North Koreans will recognize that they were abandoned by their southern brothers and sisters who weren't fighting all they could to bring down this regime. So you can imagine all the internal challenges. And then you mentioned those 30,000 North Koreans who have come south. They have a horrible time uh, uh, integrating within South Korean society. Right. They're treated very poorly. So, uh, again, there's some analogies here to East and West Germany. How did how did West Germany look over time and um, uh, this reunified Germany look over time? Did they accept their Eastern brothers back or is it still deep? Not really. Not really. Not really. There was still a, uh, you know, there was still, they kind of looked down their noses uh, at East Germans and they were sort of, could be very condescending. And there's something called the Toyhan Anstalt, which was this like trust agency where, that nationalized all East German companies and then sold them off to bidders, often for only a few bucks. And then they would just take the tax benefits of it, get the aid and then dismantle it, strip it, and then sell it to someone else. 
So there was a lot of arrogance from the West to the East. I remember I ended up in a comedy club one night in West Berlin. And he said, I remember the, the comic said, if I, if I got it right, he said something like, Hey, if there's anybody from the East in the audience, just laugh and do as you usually do learn from us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was definitely this condescension, but again, the population breakdown was, there was, it was four to one West to East. So it was a lot, it was a lot different. Uh, you know, it would be maybe one third to two thirds northerners coming into the east. I think things to be look out for would be just people in the north catching up with all they missed. You know, they've been away from the world for a few generations. They got a lot to catch up on and learn. There'd be a lot of dislocation. I fear that there would be a lot of people from the south exploiting and taking advantage of people in the north. We saw this a lot of West German hucksters and business people would come over and take advantage of East Germans. And then, you know, when they realized it was a bad deal, they cheated, the West Germans couldn't be found. Now, it's a lot easier to track people these days. But I would expect there'd be a lot of exploitation of North Koreans uh, from South and other, other nationalities who may come in and try to make a buck. Also, land restitution. You would have South Koreans who come in and said, Kim Il-sung kicked me off my land. I want my farm back. You know, it, if you're if you've been on this house for two generations and somebody comes who left during the Korean War could totally uproot your life. That that would be a big issue. But I think one thing I learned, because when I was in Berlin living, it was two years after the fall. So the euphoria had worn, worn off and the reality was setting in. You were seeing this sharp rise in neo-Nazism in the former East that was now openly reported on. And all the state jobs were being shut down and every, you know, in some cases, we have one third unemployment in some cities. Uh, people felt like their lives until that point were worthless. You know, it's sort of like when people in the matrix realize they've been living a fake life, just a program. And I think East Germans felt worthless, like everything they learned and everything they lived was a was a dream. It was fake. It didn't matter. So I think based on that lesson, we and I say we the world, South Korea, America, were unification to happen under Seoul, we need to make North Koreans feel like their lives until that point counted, that their lives didn't start with unification, that they have something to contribute to, and that their lives weren't wasted until that point, and we don't look down on them or look past them. So somehow we have to make their lives before unification feel worthwhile, because I know a lot of East Germans went through serious self-esteem and self-value issues. Some of those wounds still haven't healed. And the numbers in Korea would be much higher because you're dealing with about a third of the population uh, that comes from the north. And for all I know, the northerners are going to be proud that they didn't have foreign troops on their soil. They could come down and get into arguments with South Koreans. Yeah, well, we never had foreign troops on our soil after 1958. You're not real Koreans. Who knows? Maybe North Korean things will be trendy in the south. I can't say. There are always unexpected consequences. But I think making North Koreans feel like their lives before unification were worthwhile. That would be my one biggest piece of advice based on what I saw in East Germany after unification. And uh, one last question here. It's impossible to have a discussion about reunification without asking this, even though I do know it's very open-ended and impossible to answer here. But as we mentioned about South Koreans uh, always thinking about reunification and the German model, uh, I wonder if, and of course when South Koreans do it, each president seems to act as if it is possible. It's just around the corner. If not tomorrow, perhaps in five years, 10 years, it'll happen in our lifetime. So uh, what are your prospects here? Can, can you see it happening in any time soon? No, not really. I, I think, unfortunately, I think, well, I mean, if Kim Jong-un were to die and then I guess the sister takes over, the thing is the regime is so tied up in the Kim dynasty or dynasty, as you would say, that I think without a Kim at the helm, I don't know what reason North Korea has to exist. Because if you build yourself as an ethno-nationalist state and now center around the exploits of the heroics of the Kim monarchy, going all the way back to Mount Bekdu and all that stuff, if there's a wealthier, larger, wildly more successful ethno-nationalist state next door, then what reason do you have to exist? Uh, that's why I don't buy this theory that China would arrange like a takeover by generals of North Korea. Because I think once a Kim's not at the top, I don't think North Korea can set, exist as a separate entity. What, what, what raison d'etre does it have? So until all the Kims die or until Beijing pulls the plug, which it probably wouldn't do unless it got Taiwan, 
because remember it lost Taiwan because of the Korean War, it missed its chance to take Taiwan because of the Korean War. I I see us in this situation um, for decades to come. Sadly, I th- I think really the decision is for Beijing's to make, just like it was Mikhail Gorbachev. The thing is, I don't think Xi Jinping is Mikhail Gorbachev. So that's a good thoughtful note to leave the podcast on here. So depressing, uh, but honest. Yes, depressing, yes. but honest. Absolutely. Uh, Sean, it's always a pleasure to have you on your podcast. It's a rare treat to have you here. And uh, please make sure you come back again in the future at some point to discuss some new research of yours. Um, And of course, for people listening, I'm going to link below our previous podcast with Sean. And I encourage you to go uh, listen for yourself as well as some articles and some work of Sean and his uh, academic profile. You can go and look at his work in more detail there below. So on that, Sean King, thanks for coming on the Korean Art Podcast again. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. (laughs) 